Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Nabi Ula Muhammad A life well lived, mission well accomplished. The person of a peaceful agent and a unifier recognized for his service to religion, the nation and the world. Molvi Dr. Wahab Adam. Born in December 1944 at Brofuyedu Adanse in the Ashanti region, he had a secondary education at T.I. Ahmedia Secondary School, Kumasi. The late Mulvi Ewahabada, who was in charge of the Ahmedia Muslim Mission in Ghana for about 39 years, and I were very close. In fact, we grew up together at Adanse Brofuyedu in the then undivided Adanse district of the Ashanti region. We attended the same school together, that is uh, Adansi Profidu Methodist Primary School. His father and my father were naturally very close. His father was the second missionary for Adansi Profidu, and my father was the, what we will now call the president of the mission in the Adansi district. From Adansi Profiedu, we came down together to attend T.I. Amedea Secondary School in 1950. It was the first secondary school to be opened by the Amedea Muslim Mission. We were in the same class, but it was in 1952 that he left for Pakistan for further studies. He proceeded to the Ahmadiyya Muslim Seminary and Theological University, Pakistan, where he received a diploma in Arabic and an honest degree in theology and Islamic jurisprudence in 1960. After serving as the Buno Ahafu Regional Missionary of the Mission from 1960 to 1969, he became the principal of the Ahmadiyya Muslim Training College at Salt Pond in 1971 and was appointed to the High Office of Deputy Imam of the London Mosque in the UK. He was subsequently elevated to the position of Amir and missionary in charge of the Ahmadiyya Muslim Mission in Ghana in 1975, a position he held until his death. It wasn't the parents who decided for him to become a missionary. It was only a desire which was expressed by the parents that uh, they would wish he was a missionary and obedient and uh, dedicated you know a son as he was and uh, this has had an effect on each and every aspect of his life in his work as a missionary as a statesman and so on and so forth that has had a great impact so obedient and very principled as he must have been at that time as a young man uh, he, 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 he accepted the suggestion of the parents to become a missionary. Yes, that was uh, at a time when uh, we knew very little in Ghana here about uh, Pakistan, I believe very strongly, even though I was not there at that time, but uh, very little was known about Pakistan, you know. Uh, so one could hardly actually be able to envisage what it could have been out there. But then the challenge comes after he has left the soil of Ghana and then gone to Pakistan to find how hard and difficult that it was. Unfortunately also, not in any of the known cities of Pakistan where he could have all the comforts uh, that one would expect. You're talking of going to a place like Rabwa, which was a new settlement uh, for all intent purposes, and uh, lacking all the amenities you can think of which uh, one would expect in uh, a modern city of today or what Rabwa looks like today it was a barren kind of desert 
semi-desert land surrounded by hard rocks that uh, only produced heat and uh, made life very uncomfortable. And they were not uh, very good houses to live in. But, you know, because of the early commitment that he had right from childhood, that yes, my parents have expressed this desire, and uh, I will ensure that, uh, you know, I give uh, true meaning and reality and practical meaning to what uh, the desire of my parents is. So he endured. And regardless of the hardships, he himself told us most of the times uh, how, what they went through, you know, no electricity, food was uh, different you know, altogether. The, all the food he ate there wasn't anything that uh, has any, had anything to do with African food. The people were different, speaking a different languages, culture was different. And uh, very young as he was, but because of the spirit of dedication, that spirit of dedication really did him a lot of good because it impacted on each and every aspect of his life thereafter. Amir was a very principled man. His basic principles seem to be everybody is a human being created by God. You're all equal. You should love one another. And people who went to him, whether officially or unofficially, came back with lasting and pleasant memories of their meeting with him. He had a ready smile, he would hug you, he would crack a joke, in fact we had several jokes which we would crack any time we met. And remember, he always would give you coconut milk, not uh, Fanta, not Coca-Cola. He is a person whose property was immediate. He was a selfless person. Anything about a media, that man, as later on became my godfather. Anything concerning a media, you see him to be a different person. He loved those people who go by the teachings of Islam, no matter where you come from. He was very, very interested in education, not just religious education but also secular education. In fact, he educated all his children to university level. As a father, uh, he was very, very friendly and easy to approach. Uh, and really, really pleasant to deal with. We had many uh, moments together, uh, you know, times that he was really, really busy. Uh, this is when we were young. Uh, he would collect files and papers and so on, and then take us to a place like Abri. At the time we were in, uh, in Sopont. Uh, so he would take us to a place like Birua, I should say. Uh, and then he would let us play uh, along the uh, sea banks and then he will sit there and then do his work and then when we came to Accra he did the same thing uh, he would take us to a brewery uh, so that we as children would play and then he can do his work and that was a way of uh, spending time together with us so we all have very very fond uh, memories uh, of him in that regard a kind man very accommodating and um, patient, loving, had a lot of love for kids especially. He didn't um, want to hear a child crying. Any time he heard the cry of a child, the first thing to do was to get whoever was supposed to attend to the child, to immediately attend to the child. We were also related, we were cousins. And it's interesting to note that uh, the mother of his wife, surviving him, was also my mother's sister. So it wasn't, it wasn't just two people growing up in the village. It was two people who were related by blood 
two people who were related by education, two people who were related by marriage. He is a man of God. He is a man who had absolute trust in God and the power and the will of Allah. He is a man who has total obedience and reverence for Hilafat Ahmediyat. He is a man who is principled and who is committed to the cause of Islam Ahmediyat. And he is a man who, according to the motto of Islam Ahmediyat, loves all and hates none. Maulana Abdul Wahab Adam was a pleasant man who was hard working and who always encouraged people to develop their talents and also know their creator, their responsibility towards their creator and their responsibilities towards their fellow human beings. He did not have any kind of inferiority complex as far as his identity as a Muslim and a missionary, and a Muslim missionary for that matter, was concerned. So, with this, you know, you know, straightforwardness, and with this commitment, and with this, com I mean, being convinced about the beauty of Islam, he did not hesitate, you know, in breaking through any circles when he came to delivering the message of Islam to people. And to deliver the message of Islam, he chose a very beautiful way. You know, by he would first and foremost make you know that he cares about you. He sees you as a brother, as a sister. And he makes it easy for you to want to interact with him. And then when that gate opens, then he sells his message to you. Malvi carried a very serene atmosphere around him. Um, there are people, <laughs> particularly in some of our Christian churches who are ministers, you know, when you meet them, they are very boisterous and that type of thing. But Malvi always was very serene, a considerate person, very patient, very concerned about people, very calm, very patient, very kind and accommodating and he always had a kind word for everybody. You know he was, he's always in white, white, very clean white and nicely shaven with his hat. <laughs> and, and he, I knew he was head of the Ahmadiyya movement in Ghana and you know everybody holds him in such high esteem. As far as he was concerned, uh, obedience and loyalty to Khilafat was the most important thing. He also wanted us uh, to be honest uh, about our dealings uh, amongst ourselves as family members, uh, but also amongst the wider general public. That that uh, was the mark of a true Ahmadi. I was his personal driver for 10 good years. And the relationship was like a father and a son. I remember one time we were going to work and uh, our car broke down on the way. It was around 5 p.m. So I told Amel that I should find a taxi for him to go and drop him. And you know what he asked me? To leave me alone in that middle of the road. You see, more of a human being than myself. This is the question you put to me. And I couldn't continue again. So, Amir Wahab Adam is a person I will tell him to be with my little intellect about those people who have qualities of religion. Whenever we travel with him, when we stop on the way to buy foodstuffs, when we come to the house, he share it and give me my portion of the foodstuffs. 
which uh, it doesn't occur like that, you see, for somebody to do so much for his own driver. I was a, a, a common driver. So these are things of which, uh, if I remember of his character, then rather, you know, it motivates me to learn more from what he did. His reign did not only witness a massive spiritual and religious upliftment of Ahmediyat in Ghana. Also, the leadership that spearheaded the selfless and committed service to humanity at a time religious intolerance, mistrust, and needless cobbles among religious groups had reached an unimaginable peak. Mulvi Dr. Wahab Adam was the link and the face of peace, trust, and the restoration of harmony. Holy Quran 2, 257. The Holy Quran declares in no uncertain terms that the only war that is permissible is that which is waged in self-defense or for the establishment of freedom of religion. Muslims cannot wage war unless they are attacked. Also, the war should be for the protection of freedom of religion and of conscience. As far as Ghana is concerned, he is the very first known Markazi missionary. So some of us, when we were young, I remember in the 60s when he came to war during the opening of the war central mosque, you know, we climbed each other, we pushed down each other just to catch a glimpse of him because we heard that an African, a black man, had become a Merkazi missionary and uh, he was in town. We all wanted to see what he looked like. And you can also tell from the reaction of people in this country as to the kind of, uh, you know, a dignified, uh, uh, dedicated missionary that he was. For instance, in Ghana here, Ahmadiyyat is synonymous with Wahab Adam, and Wahab Adam is synonymous with Ahmadiyyat. In most, to most people, when you talk of Ahmadiyyat, you are talking of Wahab Adam. And when you talk of Wahab Adam, you are talking of Ahmadiyyat, okay? Now, it was with, the, with uh, Maulana Wahab Adam that uh, a link, direct link, was uh, created between uh, Ahmadi Muslims and non-Ahmadi Muslims. He actually reached out to them and uh, made friends out of them and uh, tried to build, you know, blocks with them and tried to make them understand that there was a need for Muslims of this country to come together in the interest of Islam, regardless of our different sects. Unless and until we came together, we would not be able to, you know, to propagate the cause of Islam and would always remain downtrodden. This way he started it and it finally ended up in an umbrella grouping which is known as a conference of religious bodies, you know, which brought about bringing the, all the religious bodies, the Catholic secretaries, the Christian council, the Pentecostal council, then of course the Ahmadiyya Muslim mission and uh, the office of the national chief imam brought together under one banner under one uh, uh, canopy so they could discuss things of great interest and in common to religion in this country. That is how appealing he was and that made him acceptable to Christians of this country. He was very acceptable to the Muslims and uh, that kind of animosity, you know, and uh, rivalry and uh, enmity which most non-Ahmadi Muslim scholars or what uh, uh, you may call them, hard against Ahmadiyyat, it started minimizing. Yeah, but Catholics are serving Mary, and Muslims are this, and so on. You can never live in peace with them. With, with, uh, Catholics cannot live in peace with Muslims. Muslims cannot live in peace with uh, Catholics. So we, said, we decided that, the two of us, we decided that we should create a forum whereby we would invite uh, leaders of the different faiths just to come to a forum and explain their faith. Love and quest for peace was not limited to adherence of religion, but transcended into the secular space inspired 
by the tenets of Islam that posits patriotism and love for one's country as an attribute of religion. My impression about him, the, the moment I came into contact with him, was that he was very, very different. A warm-hearted person who gave a stretched and open arm to anybody who came into contact with him. I came to be closely associated with him through the National Peace Council, of which he was a member and the unofficial vice chairman, I should say, unofficial vice chairman, because any time I was absent, everybody felt that Movi should take the seat. But he had already been a member of the Peace Council at a time when it was not a statutory body. You know, during the time of President Kufo, um, he was already a member together with Cardinal Texan and others. And they achieved a lot on the quiet, um, unknown to many Ghanaians. When we set up the Peace Council to I invited him again uh, to serve on it. And I, I wasn't disappointed in my uh, inviting him. He personified the Bible quotation that love thy neighbor as thyself. I mean, our association with him dates back many, many years. And he served on several nation changing committees that the IE had set up. And in all our dealings with him, he exhibited peace and love for country and his fellow man, no matter one standing in society. And for us, I mean, we are yet to find a man who loved, as the Bible said, he loved his neighbor, he truly loved his neighbor as himself. He was so committed. You know, you, you were left in no doubt that here was a patriot. At the time, the political temperature of the country had risen beyond descriptions. The country needed a voice of reason, a voice that cuts across the political divide to deflate the simmering tension. 2008 elections, the role Morvi played in calming the waters of Ghana, um, a lot of people didn't know except those who came close to him, you know, trying to talk to um, the um, uh, stakeholders to maintain the peace and to calm the waters of Ghana at the time. Um, the role he played in the Boku and um, chieftaincy disputes and in many, many, many other areas. He served on several of our committees, and I'll name a few, the Presidential Debates Committee, the Enforcement Body. This was a body that had, was set up in election years to monitor you know, the behavior of political parties to ensure that they adhered to the codes of conduct that they themselves had prepared and signed on to. He also served on the IEA Constitution Review Committee. And in all of it, he brought his rich experience and his peaceful temperance to bear on the discussions at all our meetings. These were nation-changing committees. And we live in a quite a, pol a polarized society. And his presence and his advice and counsel on those committees helped to assure the constituency that we're dealing with and give them hope and confidence that everything would go well so long as he was on that committee. He came across as someone who put Ghana first. I consulted him a lot, did a lot with him. I never took a step without, you know, consulting Morvi for his advice because he, he would give you wise counsel in respect of what we needed to do at a given moment. He never left me alone. Um, when we came there, we didn't have the official staff, so the board members were doing all sorts of things ourselves, apart from the executive secretary and one member staff who was there with us. And on many occasions when I needed to do an intervention, I would call Morvi and a few others, and he never left me alone. He would stand by me. Some of the outstanding things that he did during the 2012 election was when um, it was rumored that the results that were coming in were being, you know, um, doctored um, in a particular office in the Roman Rage. 
and so young people from the opposing party, National New, New Patriotic Party, had you know had assembled there, and some of their own authorities, like Honorable Yasaf Mafo and others, had gone there to speak to these young ones. They would not even listen, and the police had sent their tankers to that place. You could see that one could see a foreboding sense of uh, you know conflict about to really. Um, explode. We got wind of that immediately. I called Morvi, called Nana, SKB Asante, and some members of the National Peace Council. We went to see Afarijan about the rumor. What is it that we are hearing? He said there was nothing. Took us through the strong room together with Morvi and others. We saw things for ourselves. And then we had to come and speak to these young ones. And Morvi stood with me. It was not an easy thing, you know, facing angry people. I went there, spoke to them. I then asked Morvi to also say something, and he said, you said it. He also added his voice to it. And lo and behold, God intervened. These young people took it seriously, and they dispersed, and the tankers also dispersed. As a mirror of honesty, piety, simplicity, and love, Morvi made sure to reflect these attributes in his children. I can tell you a story uh, of once I was standing in front of uh, Akranov uh, Post Office. I think it's called Akranov Post Office. This is the one uh, next to Kwame Kumaseke. Uh, it was a Saturday and uh, I was waiting for someone there, uh, maybe about 11 o'clock in the morning. And this woman walked past uh, me, and I, I could tell that she uttered something, but I didn't hear what she said. In fact, I didn't even think she was speaking to me. So she took a few steps forward and came back and said, ask me, aren't you uh, the son of Amir Wahab? I said, yes, I'm the son of Amir Wahab. She said, but I said, Salaam Alaikum, you did not respond. Uh, and then I said uh, to her that I was sorry and I did not hear uh, that uh, she was speaking to me and I did not hear her say salam alaikum to me. But the imp import of that is uh, as the children of uh, Amir Wahab, uh, we, we had to make every effort uh, to live lives uh, that uh, will not tarnish uh, his image. And when I talk about his image, I am really talking about the fact that uh, he was uh, quite well known here in Ghana and people knew him to be a peacemaker, people knew him to be humble, people knew him to be loyal to his country. People, knew. So all those things, we had to make sure that uh, we did everything we could uh, to live in accordance uh, with that type of lifestyle. So he himself did not impose anything on us. But what we learned from him was uh, to be humble, uh, uh, to be obedient, to be loyal, and all the other things. It was through the instrumentality of Morvi Dr. Wahab Adam that led to the recognition of the two Muslim festivals, Eid al Fitr and Eid al Adha, as national public holidays. Hitherto, in Ghana, we used to have holidays during the Christmas, during the Easter, during Boxing Day, what have you, and what is there. But there wasn't a single holiday for Muslims. But he made it a point to contact and lobby all the various Muslim groups in this country, brought them together. And uh, we became very united. And then we put in place a Hilal committee which could decide when they were to start the, the first of the month of Ramadan and when to break, after consultation, of course. Then, of course, this was presented to the parliament of Ghana. And uh, they could defend it because they were all united. And uh, once the committee comes out with any decision, that was acceptable to all Muslims. Now, it was because of this unity of purpose that which he brought about that is what was what made the parliament of ghana to be able to pass the two eids eid al fitr and eid al adha as public holidays it didn't end there outside the muslim sphere out there to the other christians he was the very first person in this country who organized the religious leaders day and which uh, 
he invited religious leaders of all the various religious bodies, Muslims, Hindus, Sikhs, non you know, or what have you in this country. They all gathered first at Kumasi, and each religious leader, each religious leader in, of the country was expected to tell the public about his, the founder of his religion. His appointment as a member of the National Reconciliation Commission to help heal the wounds of victims of the country's checkered past was in recognition of his role as a statesman. You saw the high intellect and commitment with which they practice their religion. You don't get a feeling of bigotry with them. And, um, uh, and this was part of the reason when we came to set up the uh, National Reconciliation Commission, I thought uh, the membership of the MOVI would enrich the panel uh, so they would heal the, the past and current wounds of society and reconcile society. That's why I put the MOVI on it because I, I respected this uh, high mindedness, commitment to improving humanity. Uh, quality of life for all. He also gained quite a lot of prominence when he became a member of the National Reconciliation Commission. And so, but he's so soft-spoken, so respectful. I think that's the one thing you get uh, when you get close. He, he just, the respect he shows is so immense and you feel you should rather show greater respect, but it's the other way around. And he talks softly, but always engaging, always interested in the person and what you're doing and how he talks to you and so on, you know, in a very calm way. When we had to serve on the reconciliation, he brought this um, very helpful, peaceful attitude to the reconciliation too. One thing I always remember him for is that he always said that Islam well, meant peace. So the work we were doing uh, on the reconciliation gave him the opportunity to also exhibit that uh, peacefulness that uh, characterized him as a person. Well, he felt that, you know, this was a good opportunity for the country to um, at least open certain issues that we have covered up because he felt that a lot of people were, uh, had been hurt and there was, this was an opportunity for them to open up, get the pain off their chest. Those who had hurt others would have the opportunity to apologize and that at the end of the day, this country would be a more peaceful country. One thing that was very characteristic of Mobi was that whenever people told their story, he would ask them, so how do you feel now? Do you feel bitter? How do you feel about those who hurt you? And um, what do you think we can do to help? And for those who were um, still ill and or injured, I know, for, for example, he brought quite a number of uh, wheelchairs for those who were handicapped and need because of what they had been through. So um, being such a very religious person, he brought that aspect to the commission. Not only to the people who came to give testimonies, but also to us, the members of the commission. Whenever we had people come and uh, we all felt depressed or very upset about the stories they were giving, Malvi would, uh, when we recess, have a kind word to encourage us that we know it's a difficult job, but we should keep up and do it. And was not biased in favor of one group or another. And so his, you know, his um, participation and his contribution and his very presence on those committees helped to assure a great number of people within this country. And, you know, he, we benefited greatly from his wise counsel on the committees of the, on the com presidential debates committee. We had various meetings with the political parties and some of them were very heated. 
but he managed to always throw in you know some advice and a light-hearted comment that helped Tempest to calm down and indeed we really benefited from his you know his uh, contributions and no wonder we invited him over and over and over again indeed there was no committee that the IA set up that we did not invite Emir there was no committee that the IEA set up that we did not invite Emir the last committee that we invited him to sit to sit on the winner takes all committee which was really to look at a thorough, to do a thorough audit of the Constitution and go to the heart of the challenges that we see in this country and to tackle the winner-takes-all system of governance that, governance that was emerging. He was also invited to serve on that committee and he did attend a few of those meetings until he had to travel out of the country and that was the last that we saw of him. He, we've never come across a man like Emir We've worked with many, and I always say that he embarrassed us greatly. I mean, everywhere he went, he would be sure to bring staff of the IEA a present, a token of, you know, his, showing his love for us, his appreciation. His dedication, commitment, and passion for Islam Ahmediyat culminated in successive visits during his tenure as three spiritual heads of the Ahmediya community worldwide. People had only heard of Khalifa, but they had never seen one. And so people were really yearning to see one. So naturally, if you are told that a man of that stature is coming, and you will have the opportunity not only to see him, but to touch him, I mean, you can imagine. It is not something that can be described in words. During my tenure too, I was privileged to welcome um, the head of the mission or movements, global movements, I think once or twice into Ghana when he visited. And I attended uh, some of the open uh, gatherings on the your vast compound outside Accra. And so I had a enjoyable and fruitful relationship with Morvi and the entire following. People were in absolute ecstasy. We introduced an umbrella. You know, it's a symbol of the kings of our country. It doesn't matter whether it's raining or shining, but there must be a type of color. The uh, government of Ghana in those days was also very helpful because the community itself did not have that much of uh, assets, but they gave us a, a, a vehicle. They brought a Mercedes Benz. It didn't belong to the mission, it belonged to the government. Then they brought us motorcycle riders who would, you know, escort Huzu to wherever he would go.
You know, throughout the life of the Jamaat, the conference was used also as a means of raising funds. When he attended the Jalsa and saw uh, the way the funding was done, the fund was raised, he called me and at the time we also had the president. And he said, look, we are putting a stop to this now. <laughs> so, so we said, look, if we put a stop to it, how are we going to run the community? That's the way. Say, look, there is a way in the community which is universally accepted. That is to give chanda and give receipts so that and so that is what we are going to do. When it was evident that his health was gradually failing him, Malvi did not relent in his quest to project the true teachings of Islam. We supported by convincing and unassailable argument. Most of the critics did not accept the challenge. Their failure to accept the challenge in itself bore clear testimony to the fact that their criticisms of Islam were based on mere conjecture, bias, and misconceptions. I remember uh, on many occasions, uh, especially in his uh, you know, final days, he always said to me, there's nothing to worry about. We knew uh, at some point that uh, his condition was worsening. And what many people may not know uh, is that every single day, uh, according to his own instructions, we sent reports to Huzu every single day. Th that was his wish, that we update Huzu and we know who Huzu is. Uh, and we knew that once Zhu heard about how he was doing, uh, whatever Allah Ta'ala decided to do, uh, that was uh, uh, his wish. But he himself was never uh, worried. Uh, at no point did he show any sign of uh, fear. Uh, he was ready to go. It was um, painful. But uh, I wasn't too surprised when when I heard when I heard the message. I wasn't surprised, but it was painful because throughout the time that he was taken ill, as Muslims, we know that when somebody is not well, as much as we try to treat, we offer prayers to pray for Allah's mercy and. From the prayers that I offered and some of the responses that I got, it was expected. I knew he was ill, but when the news came, I still couldn't take it. So I remember that in Islam, whenever a death occurs, we say it was God who gave and it was God who took. He gave so much respect to Islam that even Muslim leaders of today, they still say it. And when they meet me as the Amir today, there are very many among them who always advise me that I should try to keep up the flag of Islam the way Maulana Wahab uh, did it. If I am not able to do more than what he did, but at least I shouldn't make them feel that Wahab is no more. His parcel do a significant blow to Islam Ahmediyat, other Muslim sects and non-Muslims in Ghana and beyond in view of his patriotism and commitment to the values of humanity, the strong consolation lies in the fact that from Allah we came from, and to him shall we all return. Malvi Dr. Wahab Adam was survived by his wife of 54 years, Madam Miriam Wahab, seven children and 11 grandchildren. His youngest daughter and eighth child, Mansura Wahab, preceded him in death. Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi rajiun.